So it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for this morning's session, Dr. Julian Elliott. Julian is a senior research fellow at the Australasian Cochrane Centre and head of clinical research in the Department of Infectious Diseases, Alfred Hospital and Monash University. Dr. Elliott's research is focused on the use of new technology to improve evidence synthesis and knowledge translation. He is also leading Cochrane's development of new evidence systems, including Project Transform, a major Cochrane project that is using new technologies and processes to improve the production of systematic reviews. He is also the co-founder and CEO of Covidence, a non-profit online platform for efficient systematic review production. Dr. Elliott directs HealthMap, a cluster randomised controlled trial of cardiovascular risk reduction in people living with HIV and currently chairs the Australian HIV Guidelines Panel. He previous, previously worked in the Cambodian government's HIV program and served as a consultant to the World Health Organisation, UNAIDS and the World Bank. Please join me in welcoming Julian to the stage. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks very much, Zach, for that introduction. It's always long and wordy. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, some of the sort of emerging systems that um, we in Cochrane and others are working on, which I think will increasingly over the next few years impact on systematic review and, uh, and evidence synthesis and knowledge translation in, in general. So my declaration of interests, I'm a clinician and clinical researcher. Um, my institution receives funding from public and commercial sources. I don't receive any of um, trial supports, speakers fees, advisory boards, or any of that activity. I currently chair the Australian HIV Guideline Committee. Um, as Zach mentioned, I'm founder of Covidence, which is a non-profit um, software provider. And I have a um, few Cochrane roles. So if we go back to some of the early days of systematic review, um, Ian Chalmers, who, as you know, is founder of Cochrane, had the vision of um, the Oxford database of perinatal trials, which preceded the, the, the um, Cochrane Library, as a database which will include a library of trial overviews which will be updated when new data become available. So when new data become available, the library of overviews will be updated. Now that vision, of course, has been quite difficult to achieve in the face of a data deluge, an increasing amount of primary research and increasing methodological expectations. And so what that's meant is that even as we work to improve the methodological rigour of our work, um, we've got real issues in the currency or the timeliness of our systematic reviews. So this is an analysis we did a couple of years ago looking at 28 high priority topics in the field of neurotrauma and looking at the time it took from a study to, um, from publication of the study to incorporation into a systematic review. And you can see that the median time for each of those topic areas range from about two and a half years to six and a half years. So this is years to translate. Um, not months, not weeks, not days. Uh, and of course, part of this is about the time that it takes to produce a systematic review. This is an analysis done by um, Andrew Trico and others um, some years ago, but we know that there really has been no, no change in this, that the median time from publication of a protocol to a, the actual systematic review is over two years. And, um, and, and, and what does this mean for users? What's the end result of this challenge around currency? So the, the issue is that the rev our reviews go out of date. And that out of date means that the conclusions and the implications of those reviews um, become inaccurate over time. So this is a study done by David Mower's group again some years ago, which looked at how long do systematic reviews remain accurate? And the definition of, um, of becoming inaccurate was a change in the direction of effect or a greater than 50% change in the effect size. So, you know, quite a significant change. And you can see that there's this linear decay in accuracy over time. In fact, 7% of systematic reviews are inaccurate the day they're published. 
because of the time from the last search to the publication date. And after about two years, about a quarter of systematic reviews are inaccurate. And so one, one of the sort of themes that we're working on is that while we, while we pursue methodological rigor, we've also got to look at the other side of accuracy, which is really about currency and timeliness. Uh, and I think a, a lot of these challenges were, in, were um, encapsulated in a, in a very um, clear and concise way in a recent NHMRC um, discussion paper about Australian guideline development, which described these challenges, inefficiency, poor quality, lack of capacity, lack of investment in IT, inaccessibility, obsolescence. These are the challenges that I, I think face not only guideline development, but of course systematic review in general that feeds into that. So one of the projects that we're working on at the moment to try and address some of these challenges is Project Transform, uh, is a Cochrane called Game Changer project, which is looking at technology, but importantly is really not a technology pro pro uh, project. It's really about how technology and people and new processes can come together to try and improve the way systematic reviews are performed. So one of the things we're looking at is study identification. Uh, this is a statement we wrote a couple of years ago that um, you know, the growing deluge of research, the noble science of systematic review really resembles archaeology. We have academic teams who search for buried artifacts and work tirelessly to reveal their true meaning. And it's really, I think, now like researchers produce these studies and throw them out into the desert and we sort of tirelessly walk, walk through the heat and the dust to try and find them again and, and uncover what, what the, what the uh, value was. We spend a lot and lot, a lot of time looking through uh, irrelevant citations to find the studies that are actually we need for our systematic reviews. So we're looking at different ways of doing this. Part of that is using um, the crowd, so citizen science, drawing on the, um, the uh, um, interest and the ability of people throughout the world to work together on some of these tasks. So we've established a, a platform, Cochrane Crowd. This is led by Anna Noll Storr at Oxford at the Dementia Group. And um, I hope many of you participate in Crowd. If not, then um, feel free to stop listening to me and get online and start um, participating. Um, so on this platform, really anyone in the world can, can um, go to the website and start participating in the work of, um, of identifying studies. The main task that's up on that platform at the moment is about identifying randomised or quasi-randomised controlled trials. So people are presented with citations and just need to make a designation. Is this a, an RCT or not? And of course, individual decisions um, may vary, and, um, but by combining the decisions of multiple members of the crowd, um, you can get to very high levels of accuracy. So to date, um, we are closing in on the um, one million classifications. There's over 3,000 people contributing and, and, and we've identified 28,000 RCTs or quasi-RCTs through that. You might wonder why would anyone in their free will go onto a website and do citation screening? Um, but I think we just have to recognise there's an incredible altruistic um, uh, motivation for many people um, who want to contribute to medical science and want to help improve evidence that's available for decision making. So I particularly like this um, quote from a doctor, I think she's actually from Adelaide, um, said, you know, I don't have time to cook for my, <laughs> for my husband, I just have to give him snack food so I can get on with um, my crowd work. Uh, and Anna and, and colleagues have run a number of um, evaluations and they consistently show sensitivity and specificity of over 99%. And really the secret is combining many uh, decisions of many individuals in the crowd. So that's some of the work we're doing on citizen science. We're also looking at the use of machines or machine learning. And um, this work is being led by James Thomas at uh, UCL in London. And so as part of Project Transform, we're developing what we call the evidence pipeline. And so we're running very broad searches um, for, for our, um, PubMed, Embase, et cetera. Um, also individual searches um, and then other um, red, uh, searches for registers that are maintained by information specialists. Any of those uh, citations that are identified 
then go through this machine learning process where the machine looks at citations that were previously associated, uh, re previous reports of an RCT and looks at to what degree is the new citation similar or different to those RCT um, citations. And through that gives a probability that this new citation is an RCT and applies a tag, a sort of metadata tag that, that um, reports that probability. Uh, in addition to that, um, we're using all the existing data about the studies that have been identified for particular Cochrane review groups and then using that to train the machine to then make a, a designation about the probability that a new citation belongs to one of those review groups. So we identify whether it's an RCT, we then identify which um, Cochrane review group it belongs to and uh, what we're now working on is also PICO tagging, so trying to describe the characteristics of that study, the population, intervention, comparator and outcome. And so what that means is that then the Cochrane database, the Cochrane Register of Studies, has a list of citations that not only have the metadata from the original bibliographic databases, but has this enriched metadata which um, quite accurately describes characteristics of that citation, which then means that when we're searching, information specialists can then use CRS to really identify the majority of the studies for a particular review. Uh, and increasingly what we're doing is combining the machine and the crowd. So some tasks can be done by machine, some by the crowd, and then in a very small subset, we need final verification from the expert information specialist within Cochrane. So a lot of it is really about how you bring crowd, machine and experts together to, to um, get the best performance. Again, in an evaluation that James and others have run, um, this was 25,000 records. Um, they were able to really like screen out about 60% of those and say, these are very unlikely to be RCTs. And again, the, um, the accuracy of that was 99.9%. Uh, .9%. So this is um, sort of research and development work. Um, it's now being deployed um, live now online in the new um, CRS web interface. So information specialists are now able to use this in the way that they're managing the citations and identifying citations for individual reviews. So that's um, study identification. Um, a lot of that work is now going to start shifting into other systematic review tasks, so uh, looking at risk of bias assessment, data extraction, etc. What we have available at the moment, though, are a set of tools that can help with some of those processes as well. We know there's an enormous amount of work involved in these steps in systematic review, in extracting data, assessing risk of bias, et cetera. This was an a, uh, analysis we did a few years ago that looked at all the steps and time and effort and people involved in uh, the, um, the conduct of a systematic review update. And um, there's a lot of steps and a lot of people and a lot of time. And through the, um, simple online um, platforms such as Covidence, which um, Zach mentioned earlier, um, but also EpiReviewer, which is another tool um, many of you would be aware of, also developed by James Thomas at UCL, um, the own JBI um, summary tools, uh, and uh, also RevMan, which is now going into an online version. You know, these set of tools are creating a new technology infrastructure or ecosystem which um, is going to accelerate many of those steps, the mundane steps in systematic review. And um, I think Paul Glazio uses the, uh, the analogy that has been used in other automation um, innovations to say, you know, this is like the washing machine. You know, the mundane things that you have to do day to day can be done by machines so that can free you up to do the important things. So the, the really high level tasks of analysis and interpretation implications, that's where we should be spending our time and effort, not in the sort of mundane things that machines can assist us with. Uh, another aspect of, of the work that we're uh, addressing is looking at the way that people work together. Again, it's not just about the tools, it's about the way that we come together to produce evidence. 
And um, I think one of the you know, really important characteristics of the world of evidence-based practice is that it is very collaborative. You know, there are many people involved who um, have a very strong sense of the public good and wanting to make a contribution. Uh, that's true in Cochrane and JBI and many other organisations. And, you know, there are um, opportunities there to, to um, work together in, a, in a, um, a more efficient way to produce the evidence. So another thing that we're working on is uh, a platform where people working in evidence-based practice can, can easily connect and help each other out to get systematic reviews done. So we've set up this um, platform called Task Exchange, which is a, uh, a pilot platform really for, um, you could call it systematic review dating. Uh, basically, anyone who has uh, a task or they need help with anything to do with systematic review can post that task to the community and then if someone's able and willing to help out they can get in contact. So it's really just a, in an online environment where you can meet others and um, exchange tasks. This is being led by um, Tari Turner at um, Cochrane Australia and um, you know again what's really striking is the way that you know, people who are struggling with particular tasks um, can all of a sudden connect into a global community and find others to help. And again, just the incredible sort of altruism of people who are, you know, willing to just dive in and help others out around the world to, um, to, get, to get reviews done and, and get evidence out. So um, these are the, some of the systems that we're developing that perhaps have an interface with, with users, with producers of systematic review, but underlying that, there's a lot of work also going on in the underlying um, data structures. So, you know, for a long time, we've been aware that systematic reviews currently sit as containers. There are, they are um, static PDF documents that are useful, of course, in and of themselves, but a lot of the value is just locked in that PDF document. And, it, and it's very difficult to move across the documents or reuse the data or pull the data in other ways. And I think particularly for guideline developers, there's this frustration that, you know, the systematic review isn't quite what I need or the question is slightly different to the question I have. And wouldn't it be great if I could just get to some of that underlying data? Um, and so um, Chris Mavergames at, in Cochrane and, and others have been now for a number of years leading this project, the Linked Data Project, which is, which is really about paying attention to the data and the value that's generated through systematic reviews. So developing a, what's called a linked data store, which holds all of those data that are um, published within systematic reviews um, and then making that available through various user interfaces. Essentially what this is about is being able to structure and reuse data in many different ways. You don't have to um, get into the detail of this diagram, but just to say what underlies this is a lot of very detailed work understanding the domain. It's called a ontology or knowledge representation. Understand how the different concepts in our particular domain are, um, are best represented and linked together. So that work has been going on for a number of years. Uh, and then also uh, what's been developed is what's called a PICO annotator. So it's an interface in which a group of people within Cochrane are adding metadata to, um, to the data that we have. So you can see here, this is, um, this is an interface in which you can PICO tag um, any particular um, data item. And it uses um, controlled vocabularies, things like SNOMED CT, et cetera, um, to apply these tags such that those data are then very structured and very reusable. And what that then means is that you're no longer stuck in the container of an individual review, you can navigate across the data. And this is a little prototype um, interface that Chris and others have developed um, where you can now you know, search for a um, a particular population or intervention or comparison, and you can look at the reviews, the studies and the analyses that have, that have dealt with that particular um, PICO element. No longer stuck in that container. And so what this means is not only that the data is um, reusable across systematic reviews, but you can then also begin to link out externally in a much richer way. 
And one of the things we're exploring is then the way you can link with guideline development. So looking at guideline development platforms like Magic and GDT, then being able to ingest and reuse those data so that guideline developers don't just have to find the systematic review, they can just ingest the data and reuse it for their own purposes. So all of this is hopefully moving towards a world in which systematic reviews um, are able to be produced much more efficiently um, and more collaboratively and in a way where the, where the value and the data is much more reusable. As part of this, we're also looking at how we can now create systems that are much more real time. So a couple of years ago, we published a paper um, proposing a, a form of updating of systematic reviews called living systematic reviews. And really what we mean by that are systematic reviews that are continually updated, incorporating relevant new information as it becomes available. So really going back to Ian Chalmers original vision of the, of the um, Oxford database, that as new data or new information becomes inviolable, that that should be rapidly incorporated into our overviews, our reviews. Um, so what are living systematic reviews? It's really a uh, prototype approach. Um, we are just beginning to establish, a, um, uh, I guess, the methods and the um, systems that would support this. Importantly, living systematic reviews are continuously updated, supported by active ongoing evidence surveillance. So really establish searches in your databases, um, set up alerts, and so every month or so get those alerts of all those searches and then process those in an ongoing way and incorporate into the review. Um, Importantly, what we're proposing is that these reviews should have explicit, transparent and predefined decisions about how frequently the new evidence is being sought and screened, when and how new evidence is incorporated, and also what thresholds can cause the review to move out of that living phase into, say, a more conventional updating um, approach. Other than that, there's really no difference in core methods, and this approach could be applied to any, any review type. So just to talk briefly about how this might differ from other reviews, um, so as we say, importantly, that there's explicit methods for not only the when, but also the how of updating. It's not ad hoc. It's not just publication of a systematic review when an end user then has no idea when the update might be coming. That's very explicit and transparent. And then underlying that is continuous evidence surveillance. Uh, and, uh, and new evidence being rapidly incorporated, but other than that, standard methods being used. So in that way, it does differ from rapid reviews. So then the question is, when should I, when should I do a living systematic review? So what we would say is, first, you have to decide whether you should do an update at all. And recently, Paul Garner and others have published uh, in the BMJ a new updating classification system um, that Cochrane is going to be using which really has a sort of set of key um, sort of uh, threshold questions that help to shape that decision about whether an update is needed. So does the review still address the current question? Um, uh, are valid methods being used? Are there new methods or are there new studies that are important? And will the adoption of those new methods or new studies really change the findings of credibility? So what we would say is first decide whether you need to update and then in, think, in terms of thinking about whether you might move into a living update process, uh, at the reality is at the moment that there is work, of course, involved in doing that. We don't actually know whether there's more work in doing a living updating process or the traditional intermittent updating process. That's an empirical question. But we think that at the, at the moment, this approach in a sort of pilot um, form should be applied to review questions that are high priority. Um, and where there's likely to be a reasonable volume of emerging research that makes this more rapid and frequent updating approach um, more relevant. And of course, the capacity to maintain those ongoing workflows. I guess what's important to note is that um, for anyone embarking on one of these pilot living systematic reviews, it's not a life sentence. You know, we imagine as for other updating processes, you know, you might run with that for a while and then gradually transition the team 
over to others. So in the practical aspects of doing living systematic reviews, there's a number of areas that, that have to be um, clarified and, um, and developed. Uh, and so these are the areas that we've identified need specific um, research and uh, piloting. Uh, search is in general um, quite similar to how we would run searches for um, conventional updates, but there are some tweaks to that. Obviously the production process can be quite different, how you organise your author team and your workflows. What we talk about technology enablers, so all the um, technology um, uh, uh, platforms that I just talked about earlier. Importantly, statistics is, is, is um, an important consideration. If you're rerunning your meta-analysis very frequently, then do you need to take into account the possibility of um, an increased rate of false positive findings? Publication is also, of course, different in that you're making available very frequently the output of, of that review update process. And then I think really importantly, um, there's this opportunity for living systematic review work to feed into a much more dynamic guideline updating process. Uh, and so at the moment we're working with um, Holger Schunemann and others at McMaster um, uh, and Ellie Arkel and his team on some pilot living systematic reviews which are feeding into a major US guideline, the American Society of Hematology. And so what we're establishing is a process in which those living systematic reviews will then support uh, living recommendations. So whenever the evidence, whenever the new research becomes available, incorporated into the systematic reviews, and then if necessary, an update to those recommendations in very rapid um, sequence. So to put support this um, establishment of this uh, approach to updating, we've established the Living Systematic Review Network. It's an informal network of people who are interested and, um, and beginning to pilot Living Systematic Review. And if anyone's interested, please um, get in touch. As part of that work, we're developing uh, interim guidance. Um, so we have a document that's in circulation at the moment. And so again, if you're interested, I'm very happy to share that and, and get your thoughts. And so uh, really in, 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 uh, in closing, what I would say is that you know, at the moment we have a cycle of um, evidence-based practice um, which could be characterised by, by this figure, health practice that leads to hypotheses, prioritisation and the, and the conduct of primary research which is published, uh, then incorporated into systematic reviews which are then published and then into some form of guidance and guidelines, knowledge translation activities and back into health practice. But what's emerging, I think, is um, new ways of undertaking evidence-based practice. Um, we're having an increasing amount of data coming out of healthcare systems themselves, what's sometimes called learning healthcare systems, or to use that terrible term, big data. Um, but it is true that those data are becoming more available and are increasingly influential in health decision-making. Um, and also, of course, increasing calls for data from primary research it's, um, themselves to be made available to individual patient data uh, repositories. We feel that all of these data sets will increasingly feed into processes of more living or more dynamic systematic review. Um, and then they, the, not only the reviews themselves, but the underlying data and analyses being made available to others through sort of data services, which will then feed into much more dynamic processes of shaping guidelines and guidance through into decision support systems and other tools and processes that shape practice. And so, of course, one of the huge challenges here is that as we innovate to try and improve our current world of systematic review, we are being faced by the challenge of increasing diversity of other data sets that are becoming available with you know, very significant strengths and weaknesses, but, there, but also um, incredible value. And, um, and of course, one of the dangers is that people will, in, will use these data sets in ways that are perhaps 
um, inappropriate or not rigorous and be making conclusions that are misleading or false. And I think one of our roles is really to engage with this world and try to help shape health decision making in a way that is using these data sets, um, but in a way that is rigorous and in the end is helping our clinicians and our patients deal with this deluge of data that's coming you know, from the electronic medical record, from their Facebook and Twitter feed, from their wearables, their mobile phone, whatever it is. There's a lot of hype in this world, but I think there's also, there are opportunities and um, it's by us engaging in that that I think the best value is going to be gained. Um, and so as part of that, um, we are um, now working with the Gates Foundation and others looking at new ways of making data available um, for, particularly for um, pregnancy and, and early childhood. And so this is a sort of vision of the Gates Foundation um, in a project they call Healthy Birth, Growth and Development Knowledge Integration, using data sciences and very large data sets um, to create um, new insights, interpretation and inferences that lend through to action and impact. Now, of course, this is a very different world to our traditional world of evidence-based practice. But again, I think it's through that, that communication and collaboration between our communities and those communities of people working in, in data science that we're going to get the, the best value. So I'd just like to thank uh, everyone who's been involved in the Living Systematic Review work uh, and also in Project Transform and my other colleagues in Cochrane and, and beyond. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.